Yes, joy to the world. Friends, welcome back to the Wild at Heart podcast. John Eldridge here in the third week of Advent, the week of December 13th. Christmas is actually next week. We will celebrate the fourth Sunday of Advent in about seven days. And then after that, the Saturday following is Christmas. So I thought it would be good to come back this week to Advent, Advent themes. In the third week, we light the joy candle, often called the shepherd's candle. The obvious connection there because they were the ones to whom joy was announced and they were thrilled and filled with joy. I want to explore some of these themes with us, see if we can find that joy for ourselves. So let's pick up appropriately with the shepherd's story from Luke chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, nearby Bethlehem, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. I can't can't read that without hearing Handel's Messiah in that. Glory to God. The Christmas story is so wild, friends, and we suffer under the curse of familiarity. But you you just go, wait, okay, the heavenly host is so excited about the invasion of the kingdom of God into this world, the beginning of the overthrow of evil and the ransom of the human race. Here it is, God's wild plan, Emmanuel, incarnation, the Son of God, born to a teenage virgin. And you're like, the shepherds? Why? Why did he choose to to tell the shepherds? And actually, it isn't God who tells the shepherds. It's the angels. And I just wonder if there's a moment in the council of the Lord where they are so excited, they're just begging the Father, please, can we tell somebody? Let us tell somebody. And he's like, okay, all right. I don't want you to tell Rome. I don't want you to tell, you know, Caesar. I don't want you to tell the media. Um, You can tell these guys who are camping out in the wilderness. You can tell them, but nobody else. And they're like, okay, okay, okay. Just those guys. Great. Thanks. And so, you know, one angel shows up and then the others can't like keep the joke. They can't like keep at a surprise party. They break out too early and suddenly, boom, they're all there just celebrating. (laughs) I love, I love that moment. Shepherds out in the field and the angels breaking through. And then here's the message. They say, we bring you good news that will cause great joy. Good news causing great joy. I want to explore that because I think if we all just like suddenly take our emotional temperature Great joy is probably not except in 2% of my listeners right now. We don't tend to walk around a pandemic-ridden world with 
great joy. Pandemic or not, we don't tend to move through life in a state, you know, kind of a constant awareness of being of great joy. Now, some of us get there through the birth of a child, through a son who comes back from combat safely at weddings. I love weddings. I'm such a sucker for weddings. I love the joy of it. I mean, it it comes to us, right? The cancer's gone into remission, the good report from the doctor. Joy does break into our lives, but it doesn't tend to be around Christmas, frankly, if we're honest. We're harried and hurried and busy and you know, you try and generate it. You watch a few Christmas movies, you listen to some carols, you know. We'll get some joy, hopefully, as Christmas Eve arrives and Christmas Day. But I think the whole conversation around joy for most people actually feels filled with pressure rather than with joy. Like, oh, okay, okay, joy, right? I guess I ought to be a more joyful person or I should be feeling more joy around this season. So I want to help us get there. If the promise is good news causing great joy, let's let's see if we can tap into that today. First, I want to begin with the joy of salvation. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. That is the verse that Jesus quotes in Matthew 4 as he steps into the scene. It is from Isaiah chapter 9. And if we just linger in that for just a moment, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of the shadow of death. The land of the shadow of death. Friends, we can take up the road towards joy if we first look into the valley of the shadow of death. If you simply linger for even a few moments with the realization that if Christ had not intervened, if this Christmas plot had not worked, then death would still win. Death would still rule. The very simple fact is you will never see anyone that you love again. Everyone that you have loved and lost, your dear grandparents or someone precious to you, a child, a spouse, a close friend, you'll never see them again if this doesn't work. The power of death over the human race was so gripping for so many centuries. Most of the religious attempts of man and the rituals and the bizarreness and the sacrifices and the appeasements and the you know the shamanism and the trinkets and the amulets that you hang over your door and all that were were by a terrified human race that had no answer to death if it's been a while since you've been to a funeral let me tell you a quick story some friends of mine were pregnant with their fourth child, and they were absolutely delighted to learn that it was a little girl. They were so thrilled to be having a girl. And then they quickly learned early in the pregnancy that she had a chromosomal problem that would result in the fact that she would live only a few hours after her birth. And in this world, living in the shadow of death, too many people recommended to them that they just terminate the pregnancy, but they don't believe in that. And they wanted to carry their daughter to term. They wanted to hold her 
and kiss her before they handed her into the arms of Jesus. I went to that funeral, and it was one of the most beautiful, heartbreaking things I have been to in a very long time the celebration and the honor of life, even a life that lasts only two hours, well, nine months and two hours. And then the tiny little casket up front with the flowers on it and the heartache of the mother and of the father. And I was just weeping through it, weeping, even though I believe in the resurrection. Like, even though my heart is held by the knowledge that that little girl is well and that they will see her again, death is so awful. I just sat there weeping for the family. Those living in the land of the shadow of death need light to dawn. They need a hope to come. Because here's the deal. If there is no answer to death, no other answers matter. I don't care what your worldview is, what your religion, what your philosophy, what cool things are unfolding in your life right now. If there's no answer to death, no other answers even matter. Because in the end, you lose everything. And this is the story of the human race after Eden. And this is the one thing that has terrorized humanity for centuries is what do we do about death? How do we fight it, avoid it, struggle against it, bear it, face it, and then what? And then what happens? Mild he lays his glory by, the wonderful carol goes, Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. This is, this is the joy of the angels. This is the joy of God. That death no longer wins. Evil no longer wins. Paul, writing in Colossians Chapter 1 says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. No longer in the valley of the shadow of death. The kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Because the grip that death has held over the human race was unbreakable until Christmas because of the power of human sin. Death was not the plan. Death entered into the world because of the sin of Adam and Eve and of the whole human race after them. And not only do we fall into the valley of the shadow of death, we fall into the grip of evil over the human race, over our destiny. And so Paul here is talking about living in Christ and finding wisdom and all that's available to us, giving joyful thanks to the Father He says, the reason that you can have this life is because of what's been done for you. For God our Father has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of Jesus, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We have been rescued from death and from the enemy's hands. 
I was talking to my son Blaine about this a few weeks ago, and he had written a little bit about the understanding of death among the Jews of Jesus's day. So I want to read this. He said, the Jews of Jesus's day had a complex picture of the underworld, and it wasn't a place you wanted to be. Sheol is dark, all shadows and cold, a country of spirits and ancient witch kings, of marshes and windy fields and black rivers and cages and grimacing castles. He was talking about the death of Lazarus before Christ raises him, and he says Lazarus was lying there under several inches of water, very still, clear water, at the edge of a long, dark, shallow sea. His hair moved like reeds, and his face was pale. There were spirits around him with, shall we say, long rods to drive him further into the marsh. And it is at that moment that Jesus calls out in a commanding voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus is rescued from death. Lazarus is brought back to life. This is the joy of the angels. This is the joy of our salvation, that we have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness, rescued from the grip of evil, rescued from death itself, that death does not get the final word. Sin, evil, does not get the final word. I was reflecting on George MacDonald's sermon called The Last Farthing, in which he is trying to help people understand the generosity and the openness of the invitation to salvation in Christ and what it will be like in death for those who say, no thanks. As the parable says, we don't want this man to be our king. Listen to how he records it. This is someone waking up from death who have rejected the offer of the kingdom of light. The man wakes from the final struggle of death in absolute loneliness, such a loneliness as in the most miserable moment of deserted childhood he never knew. Not a hint, not a shadow of anything outside his consciousness reaches him. All is dark, dark and dumb. No motion, not the breath of a wind, never a dream of change, not a scent from far off field, nothing to suggest being or thing besides the man himself, no sign of God anywhere. God has so far withdrawn from the man that he is conscious only of that from which he has withdrawn. In the midst of the live world, he cared for nothing but himself. Now, in the dead world, he is in God's prison his own separated self. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Friends, the, the road to joy leads right through the celebration of our salvation of what this baby is going to mean for our lives, the rescue from death, the hope of a life unending. And I think, I, I just going to have to be honest here this week, I think one of the reasons that joy is so difficult to access for people these days 
is that we have a very weak view of salvation. It's become something, I don't know, just taken for granted. You know, I was listening to some people talking about a death in their family, and they were telling me what it was like to kind of catch the heart of the spouse left behind. And and they were saying, but 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 we'll all be together again. We'll all be together. And their view, they're not followers of Jesus. Their view is that everyone, everyone goes to heaven when you die. And that's simply not true. That is not what Jesus, the most loving, compassionate person you will ever meet, the one who came at Christmas to rescue us from the kingdom of darkness and from the valley of the shadow of death. That's not what he teaches. Jesus says in Matthew 7, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. And of course, in Matthew 24 and 25, that you know, he's riffing on the trials of the end of the age, and then he tells the parable of the ten virgins, and five have enough oil and five don't. Five run out of God. Five run out of faith. They run out of any interest in God. So when the shout comes, the bridegroom is coming. Christ is returning. They are those still sitting in the land of darkness and in the shadow of death because they didn't want more of God. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. I think our joy is waiting for us in a fresh appreciation of what it is like to be the five bridesmaids who have oil left, who have love and faith, who have God, who are welcomed into the wedding feast of the Lamb, to the joy that death does not get the final word because of what happened at Christmas, the beginning of the invasion, of course, up through the cross and the resurrection, that we do not have to fear death anymore. And we do not have to fear the death of those we love who will put their lives in the hands of God, that Satan does not get to hold us in his kingdom anymore, that we are transferred to the kingdom of light, the kingdom of joy, the kingdom of God. Like, imagine if that had not happened for us. Psalm 51, David cries out after being really, really confronted with his own sin. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence. That harrowing portion I just read from George MacDonald, don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation. Friends, I think that a really foggy and frankly cheap and universalist view of what salvation is and who gets to participate in it has really robbed us of the gratitude and the wonder and the joy of it. In this weary hour, in the, we are in the hour of the 10 bridesmaids, and people are running out of oil, and they are turning to 
easier views of reality, easier views of faith. They're, they're either just choosing the idea of, no, you know, when you die, it's just over and that's it. Or, or they're trying to move to kind of a more culturally acceptable, inclusive idea that, that salvation just kind of happens for everyone, whatever they believe and whatever they think of Jesus, which is absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, what is the cross for? <laughs> what is the death? of Jesus for, but to ransom us from the kingdom of darkness. And the offer is for everyone. I mean, Jesus' arms could not have been more wide open than when he died on the cross. It is for everyone. But there are people who will simply say, no thanks, not interested. And so I just shudder and it turns me to gratitude and to my knees and to, oh my gosh, like I get it why the angels were just, they had to tell somebody, they had to break through and one of them shows up and he's telling the story and the others can't help themselves at the surprise party and poof, you know, they just all pop out from behind the couches too. And they're celebrating and rejoicing the central message, which is salvation, okay? So joy is to be found there, joy, immense. And then there's the joy of the great restoration. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord, joy, and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving, and the sound of singing. Those the Lord has ransomed will return. They will enter the kingdom with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. It's all about joy, and the joy is the restoration that is coming to us. I I love it that the hymn, Joy to the World, let heaven and nature sing. All creation has been groaning, is groaning still for the day of the restoration. And it's coming and it's real. And one morning you will wake up and there'll be no more evil in the world be completely gone. Every story will be set right. The world itself will be shining in all of its newness, like a birthday present. You will be new. Your heart will be new. And of course, laughter and singing starts taking place spontaneously, right? As we begin to enter into the wonders of the restored Eden. Oh my goodness, friends, the joy of our salvation, the joy of the coming restoration, because as you know, salvation, you know, begins in the epicenter of the human heart, but then it spreads out to all creation. Yeah. And he writes famous line is that what the early Christians believed is that God was going to do for creation what he did for Jesus on Easter, that the resurrection of this baby who's coming to us again in a few weeks in our celebrations as we remember it, this child, right, has been raised from the dead, and then God's going to do that for all of his creation. And this is what we celebrate at Christmas. This is why the angels are so happy. (laughs) Let heaven and nature sing. And friends, like the imminence of it, You know, if you've been tracking with us this fall, I did a podcast just a little while ago on my joy. Jesus said, I want to give you my joy. That's out of John 17, that you may have my joy. And part of his joy, friends, is that the restoration of all things and the setting right of every wrong, the removal of all that is evil in the world is really, really, really close his joy in it, and the restoration of Israel at the end of World War II as a nation is nothing short of an absolute miracle. No one could have predicted it. 
I mean, all these promises, God saying, I will bring you back. Your sons and daughters will come from afar. You will be restored as a nation. Lots of Old Testament promises about that, but nobody could see that coming. And then all of a sudden, boom, it, it's here. <laughs> it's like, what? And, and then in Matthew 24, you know, Jesus gives a number of signs and he says, watch for the signs. And he says, just like the fig tree, you know, when you see its leaves greening out, you know, the fruit's coming. He says, so when you see these signs, you know, the kingdom's near. So he wanted us to be aware of the imminence of it. He says this, he says, because of the increase of wickedness, he's talking about what it's like to live through the last hours of the age, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world or to all nations as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The end of evil, by the way, the end of death, the end of sin, the end of heartache, the end of loss, not the end, end. There is no end, end. It's like, and then the beginning will come, the beginning of joy, the beginning of happiness, the beginning of the, the recovery of your life and your purpose, which got derailed at the fall of man. Okay, so he gives this, he says, and then the end will come. And you've heard me talk a little bit about this, that in the missionary communities in the world and in, in the leadership of the mission movements in the world, there's a pretty growing consensus that the gospel in some shape or form will have reached all language groups, all tribal people groups in the next two to 10 years, two to 10 years. And you go, whoa, that is like, that is super close. And it's not the only sign. And I'm not predicting dates, guys, but I'm just telling you, just allow yourself the possibility for a moment. We are so caught in our cynicism and in our suspicion because of heartache and because of disappointment. We are so caught in, well, hang on there, you know, maybe kind of thing. Just, just let your heart go here for a minute. If Jesus were to return in the near future, in the matter of a handful of years, absolutely nothing that weighs your heart down right now will even matter. I mean, it, it's not going to matter. You will suddenly find yourself laughing and weeping for joy. Your body is going to be completely young and new and free of pain. Your soul will be completely young and new and free of pain. Everywhere you look, the earth is brand spanking new. No disease, no death. It's reborn and ready for adventure and exploration. You'll enter the city of God for the coronation of Jesus. You'll share in what will probably be, you know, the wedding feast of the lamb, quote unquote, that thing, that party is going to go on for probably a year because there's a lot of stories to be told. <laughs> there's a lot of rewards to be given out. Okay. You'll travel the earth with your friends on great adventures. You'll inherit your estates. Just let your heart entertain the possibility that that is actually going to happen really, really soon. And I'll guarantee you, you'll, you'll start finding the joy of your salvation again, okay? The joy that the angels are proclaiming. So let me come back to Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, the light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government, the kingdom, right? The coming kingdom will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And as he's reflecting on the kingdom, he says, there will be no end. 
He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it in justice and righteousness forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I wanted to read some passages from Frederick Beekner's book, Telling the Truth, the Gospel is Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale, but we don't really have time. Let me read something he quotes from Tolkien. Tolkien writes that the fairy tale does not deny the existence of sorrow and failure. The possibility of these is necessary to the joy of the deliverance. It denies, in the face of much evidence, if you will, universal final defeat, giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant as grief. It is the mark of the good fairy story, good fairy tales, of the higher or more complete kind that however wild its events, however fantastic or terrible the adventures it can give to child or grown-up, when the turn comes, a catch of the breath, a beat and lifting of the heart, near to or often accompanied by tears, joy beyond the walls of the world. And so I think here in the third week of Advent, if we're not finding that joy, if it's not accessing our hearts, I think we need to ask ourselves why. We pray, Holy Spirit, why? What is in the way? Have we lost the wonder of our salvation? Are we trapped in the present moment, grasping for happiness now with no real operating belief about the restoration that is just around the corner? Are we cooperating with the great falling away? Are we letting unbelief in? Jesus, give me your joy. Rescue me from this. And that's what he offers in John 17. He's, he's praying his, you know, among his last prayers, recorded prayers for us. And he says, I'm coming to you now, Father. But I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they, all those who love me, anyone, anyone who opens their heart to Jesus, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. And I read that and I go, me, me, me. Like, are you kidding me? I can experience the full measure of the joy of Jesus? Oh my gosh, friends, because it worked. It worked. The whole plot. And the angels break out in the surprise party upon the shepherds because maybe, maybe that was the one group they had permission to like, you know, kind of blow up over it and, and just celebrate, you know, joy, news that will cause great joy. And so joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her King. If you have not opened your heart to the King of the world, to Jesus himself. This would be a really good time. Jesus, I'm really sorry for putting you off and pushing you away. I don't want to fear death. I don't want to be in darkness. I need the kingdom and the joy and the happiness. I need you, God, desperately. I need my ransom. I need my rescue. And so I open my heart to you utterly. Oh, Jesus, come. Come and be my salvation. Come and be my joy. And let the full measure of your joy fill my heart. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing, joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, hills, plains repeat the sounding joy. 
because the restoration is so near and because our salvation is real and precious and costly beyond telling. This is the joy that we celebrate here in the third week of Advent.